Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And today I want to talk about how our understanding of genre is sometimes uh, leading us astray. Why it's not necessarily the indicator that we assume it can be. But I want to look at like, one of the old saws about the writing of stories and the reading of stories. The, the idea of the, the seven basic plots. Now, all of this is dealing with a, an element of literary criticism and literary analysis called structuralism. You, you see it with Freytag's Pyramid. Take a whole load of individual unique stories, strip away all of those elements, those details, the specific characters, and we look at function. We look at the bare bones. We look at what the event is, what it does within the narrative. And because of that, Freytag came up with that little diagram that everyone knows of introduction, instigating event, rising action, climax, falling action, denouement. Everyone, everyone gets that. Everyone understands that. There was a journalist called uh, Booker. I don't remember his first name, but Booker um, did an analysis, basically an analysis, and came up with what he termed basically the meta plot. And the meta plot was anticipation, the dream stage, the frustration stage, the nightmare stage, and then resolution. Now, you go, oh, well, that sounds completely different. Except when you think about Freytag's pyramid, the anticipation stage, that's where the call to adventure happens, borrowing a term from the hero's journey from Campbell, which is also a different structural approach. But anticipation is the setup of the world and what this big problem is. Then the dream stage. This is when events start to happen and they're going the way that they, the hero basically wants. The hero has successes. You go, great. And then there's the frustration stage in which the hero has some failures, you know, down to the belly of the beast and all of those things from the hero's journey. Then the nightmare stage where all could be lost. It's all coming down to this one thing and the hero has a million to one shot but it just might work. And then the resolution, yeah, the hero wins. Not only does it borrow a lot from Freytag's pyramid, but it's a lot like um, the hero's journey. It's the similar sort of thing. Start at the beginning, set things up, say who the hero is. There's an instigating event. And then the hero has some successes and some failures and some successes and some failures until it all comes down to this one thing that then is resolved and we all carry on. And that's all well and good. It's, it's similar ways of talking about the same thing, trying to think about them in different relationships because a lot of people assume with, with Freytag's model that it's a event and then there's this uh, building towards the climax. And they forget that that's made of little increments that successes and failures and successes and failures to give variety to the reader or to the viewer, depending on what type of narrative it is. But Booker also came up with these seven basic plots. Now, I'm going to have to refer to my notes because it, typically I, they're not particularly useful, but I wanted to talk about them because people are all, oh, there only are like three types of stories in the world, tragedy, comedy, and something else. Or, you know, th there's four types, there's five types, there's seven types, there's 21 types. Each time it's applying... See, anytime I try to try to record outside, I don't mind the bird song so much. It's the trains. But anyway, but each time someone comes up with this, they're identifying story patterns, these structures. And the way that we do this is we strip away the individual nature and the uniqueness of each of these stories to look at broad, generalized patterns within them. And so, for instance, um, Booker came up with overcoming the monster. The protagonist sets out to defeat an antagonistic force, an antagonistic evil, a monstrous thing. And usually that thing is threatening either the hero, something the hero cares about, the hero's uh, country or kingdom or something like that. Like it's, there's a big bad and the hero's going to defeat it overcoming the monster rags to riches 
a poor, uh, lower socioeconomic class individual goes through a series of trials, travails and adventures to gain all of this power, usually power and money, and then in the middle of it will lose a whole load, but then gain it all back at the end. And at the end of it, they are both rich, powerful, but also a wonderful person. Brewster's Millions, for instance. But then identifies the quest. The protagonist or the protagonist on a quest group set out to acquire an, an important object to, to go to a place. And there are temptations and, and obstacles and things along the way and problems that have to be solved all so they can get the thing. So that basically a travel, it's a fetch quest. It's a hot coupon collecting thing. Yeah. Voyage and return. The hero or the protagonist goes to a strange land somewhere new, has a series of adventures in which they conquer, uh, Im conquer impossible odds or problems that resolve issues in the land learns a whole bunch of new things because they have gone out into the world and learned something, returns home a better person. Comedy. And this is, the, this is one of the issues that we have because comedy, you have both the, the modern conception of comedy, meaning ha ha ha, this is humorous, and the classical meaning of comedy, meaning, but seriously birds, I said I didn't mind it too much, but like that's just excessive, like calm down. No one's taking your tree away. But the classical sense of a comedy in that everything ends up correctly, everything ends up properly, the um, characters are rewarded. And typically things start off at a certain point in a comedy, things go really, really badly wrong. And then by the end, everything has gone right and they end in a better place than when they started. That's traditional comedy. But comedy humor is a different type of thing. And there's some, some like blurring in how Booker kind of discusses this because there is a focus on, um, on this sort of thing being light or humorous or uh, not, not as serious. The central premise is triumphing uh, over adversity and it leading to a happy conclusion. Tragedy is basically almost the reverse of this. Classical form of tragedy, the classic pattern is a hero starts off, things start going really, really well, and they're, everything's going brilliantly, and then everything goes wrong, and they end up in a worse position than when they started. And usually the tragic element is it is a flaw within the character themselves that causes their fall. And right, again, another big sort of, generalized pattern that we've known since, I don't know, ancient Greece. And I think the last, one, the, the last one is rebirth. An event forces a character to change and become a better person. Um, something happens that the old character essentially dies and is reborn as this new character and it's usually a much better character. Uh, a Christmas Carol is a good example of this where you have Ebenezer Scrooge is horrible and mean and nasty, goes through his trials and emerges at the end a completely different person. He is reborn. Now, even just listening to that sort of very simple synopsis of a lot of this, because Booker goes into a lot of detail about these things. But ultimately, saying like these are the, the seven basic plots that we all work with. But okay, you can have a quest overcoming the monster that's also a voyage and return. And that's not, if you put those three things together, that's an entirely different thing to overcoming the monster. So what it's really identifying are basic story patterns. And that's why he calls them, you know, plots. These are basically tropes, but tropes of narrative patterning, not necessarily a constituent narrative element. And we see the same thing. They, uh, when people refer to enemies to lovers as a trope, that's what this is. This is just an identification of very broad, generalized 
abstract notions of story patterning being called plots instead of tropes. And with all of these things, if you combine two of them, it's now a different pattern. And it's made from those constituent elements and they'll be interwoven in different ways. But overcoming the monster as part of the quest is not the same as either the quest or overcoming the monster. It's a different thing. So it's not that there are only seven basic plots. It's that there are all of these elements and they are so generic, so abstract, so bland that they can be twisted and applied in a whole load of different ways. And that's one of the things that we talk about in terms of when we, we talk about genres within fiction, you know, typically like science fiction, horror, fantasy, there are different ways that we actually codify this stuff. So for instance, if it has a whole load of um, spaceships that can travel faster than light, we'll, we will code it as science fiction because those type of spaceships don't exist, but it seems based in a scientific principle of space flight. Therefore, it's both science and fiction. It's science fiction. But the story doesn't necessarily flow from that element. That could be a veneer over the top of a completely different type of story. In the same way, the usual perennial argument of, is Star Wars a new hope, science fiction, or is it fantasy? And when you think about it, when we strip away a lot of the uh, science fictional veneer, i.e. being set on a desert planet and with a big space station, but you think about the constituent elements, you have the young chosen one hero, a mentor with mystical abilities who gives him a special sword and they are trying to defeat an evil dark lord. And the young chosen one also has and finds out he has magical abilities. Now, it might all be described in science fictional terms, but we recognize that story pattern from fantasy. That is a very standard folkloric or fantastical narrative arc. And because of that, that's what causes kind of the confusion. It's relayed or narrated to us or shown to us in a science fictional language. It's a lightsaber, not a magic sword. He's a Jedi, not a wizard. But essentially, the function, when we strip away that individual surface level, the function and role that these characters play, that these elements are, those are more traditionally associated with fantasy, hence the whole confusion. And also, you know, they have sound in space, so clearly it's not real science. But what I'm trying to illustrate with this is, yes, you can do these structural elements, and it, gives, it can give us insight into the type of story that we're looking at, why these structural approaches can be so useful. I'm going to illustrate in a second with the recent film Roadhouse with Jake Gyllenhaal. Because I rewatched the uh, the 1984 was it 1984 one with Patrick Swayze now, it was sometime in the 1980s. I rewatched it and then I rewatched or I watched the uh, the new one with Jake Gyllenhaal. And one of the things that I find fascinating is in the new version, and it is a fairly fairly faithful updating of essentially the same story with many of the same characters, almost many of the same plot beats. Uh, many of the same action sequences and the types of things going on as the original, but it updated the setting and moved it to Florida instead of rural, wherever it was, like Idaho or something, or Montana, or I don't know, some rural area. <laughs> I'm not good on American geography. But you essentially have the same character. And instead, uh, they changed his backstory a little bit. And Jake Gyllenhaal looked an awful lot bigger than uh, Patrick Swayze did in the, in the 1980s version. And was a lot more menacing and powerful in, in the fight scenes and how the fight scenes were done, different tone. But interestingly, in the new one, when Elwood, Gyllenhaal's character, arrives uh, at the Keys, a young girl basically describes him and what he is doing as a Western. And, you know, this is kind of, what we would call lamp shading, like shining a lamp directly at the thing that this is. Because if you watch Roadhouse, either version, 
and you strip away the contemporary setting and just look at the plot beats, this is a Western. You have the heroic character, the reluctant heroic character, who's really good at his job and his job is violence, being called in to a small town by a business owner who is having trouble with essentially the, the local mayor or the local businessman who is corrupt and has a, an evil posse. And when they arrive in town, they meet a, a lovely young lady who has a socially acceptable job. We could She could have been a governess. She could have been the school teacher, but she's a proper young lady. And he's from the, the wrong side of the tracks and he's rough and ready because he lives by his own code. And then there's the various showdowns with the corrupt evil person's gang, their evil posse, their bad cowboys. This is a classic Western story. You, you could map this onto so many Westerns. And yet what they did was they took a Western, they updated the setting to a contemporary setting for the audience. They changed Gunslinger to a professional cooler or basically security expert for a bar. But all of the plot beats, the love interest having the socially acceptable job. Oh, she's a doctor now, not a school teacher. Um, instead of the corrupt mayor or the corrupt mine owner or the corrupt landowner, it's the corrupt businessman or the corrupt uh, drug dealer who wants to take over all of the land. It's the same thing. They've just updated from with the function. It's the same function, the same type of role. But what they've done is look at the contemporary setting and go, what can what person would fulfill this role? And so even though you wouldn't look at either film Roadhouse and say, you know what, this is a Western, you might recognize the plot beats, but you wouldn't instinctively call it a Western because it's not set in the old West. It doesn't have gunslingers. It doesn't have cowboys. It doesn't have any of that sort of paraphernalia, but the story is the same. And so if you knew someone who was a big fan of those spaghetti Westerns or the classic John Ford Westerns. They might enjoy Roadhouse because even though it's not set in the same time period and space, it is a Western story. And that's why genre can be very, very misleading. You look at the trappings of Star Wars and say, and see science fiction. But when you understand the underlying plot beats and roles and functions of the characters, you see fantasy. When you look at Roadhouse, you see modern day uh, sort of small town bullying landlord kind of thing. But it's a modern day social commentary set in a bar. You don't immediately go, oh, that's just a Western. But the underlying plot elements, the underlying beats, the underlying structures, the functions, the roles, they are all classical Western. And so this is one of the fascinating things, because when we think about genre, when we think about you know, calling something epic fantasy, calling something uh, space opera, genres are a way and subgenres are a way of grouping like with like. But unless we specify what the elements are that we are grouping together, it can lead to a miscommunication. Because even something like science fiction, a science fiction novel could take a novum, the way that Darko Suvin describes it, take a novum, a new thing, an element of science that is new, extrapolate from it how that would impact society, what the ramifications are, and generate narrative from that change, that the novum is generating the change. That's one way to do science fiction. Another way to do science fiction is to take an old Western, cover it in science fiction terminology and, and science fiction imagery, and you end up with something like Firefly. It's a space Western. It is clearly all of these Western stories, but just placed in a sort of space opera world. They're both science fiction. They both contain science fictional elements, but they are trying to do radically different things. So if someone said, I really like science fiction, you wouldn't necessarily go, oh, Ursula Le Guin's The Dispossessed and Joss Whedon's Firefly. 
there's your two recommendations because you like science fiction. They are radically different types of science fiction. And one of the reasons this all popped into my head was I watched the new Code 8 Part 2. I'd seen Code 8 before, and it's the Amnol Brothers. Um, and I was watching it and thinking to myself, like, this is, it's a down-to-earth, gritty, superhero world that is a dystopian science fictional reality. There are uh, robot canine units and there are there's 24 hour surveillance with these giant sort of drones that fly over the city controlled by the police with their sophisticated surveillance so they can map everyone and track everyone. It's a police state and all of the people with these superpowers and admittedly they are very minor superpowers which is why you know they aren't taking over the world and they're a small fraction of the population. They have been relegated to living in these large high-rise social housing projects. In this case, I think it's called the tar. But essentially, it's a tar block of social housing for the least affluent uh, members of society. And they are basically all uh, uh, superpowered individuals. And they have very minor superpowers. And I watched this whole thing. And... When you boil it down, when you strip away the fact that it's a minority population that the majority does not approve of and is trying to contain. If you look at it in that sort of general aspect and you take away the superpower aspect, the reason for it, but you, you look at it in terms of the social dynamic. You go, it's a minority that's on the social fringes of society and society doesn't want to deal with them and is trying to place them all in one place, doesn't really care about them. And the tar block is run by a drug dealer. Doesn't matter what the drug is, doesn't matter where it comes from, that's specific to the narrative, but there's this powerful crime boss drug dealer who is taking care of his own. It's a godfather type figure, a mafia figure. But again, this is in a science fictional superhero universe. And then there's the police and the, uh, the idea of the corrupt police force and them being in on it. And, all of these sorts of things. So when you, you scrape away the dystopian science fictional elements, you could easily take that story and put it in Baltimore as a, an episode of The Wire because it's a tower block. And instead of um, one of the Amnals playing the, the boss, you'd have one of the Barksdales. Um, you could have Idris Elba. He's the crime boss. Instead of its superpowered individuals, it could be a disenfranchised African American community. It's about drug dealing and corrupt police, and of course, the Wire dealt exclusively with that. So the question becomes: Why? Why would you take something like an episode of the Wire, which was so specifically rooted in Baltimore? Why would you strip away those individual elements and put in these allegorical or symbolic elements? make it a superpowered individual, they are now in the fringe of society. And one of the reasons is because The Wire was so specific to Baltimore, and it is a brilliant TV show, but there were complaints from people saying, now people have the wrong impression of Baltimore because it's a real place. And also people looked at it and went, yeah, but that's just Baltimore's problem. Because they couldn't see beyond the specifics. They couldn't see it as a general aspect because it was so rooted in reality. But when we move it into a science fictional or even fantastical reality, we move from a specific societal problem in a specific locale and we make more general statements. So the superheroes on the fringes of, or the superpowered individuals on the fringes of society in Code 8 could be easily read and interpreted as a could be easily interpreted as an aspect of any society that has been marginalized be it because of race ethnicity uh, culture sexual preference uh, sexuality gender that we map it as a minority group that has been disenfranchised because the specific group is now superpowered individuals which don't exist we as viewer get to map onto that an aspect of understanding an underlying meaning 
the corrupt police officers. We don't look at it and go, oh, this is Century City, and it's only, we look at it as more representative of a corrupt system or corrupt members within a system. We see how the police in this story are no longer about protecting their citizens, but about enriching themselves. We start looking at it in those more abstract terms. We look at how Code 8 sets up this world where laws have been drafted by the majority specifically to structurally disenfranchise the people with powers. There are all of these different elements to it that suddenly it's not about the specifics anymore. It is more about this generalized abstract patterning underneath. It is about these basic plots. And because of that science fictional setting, the story is not being generated from the novum. Because this is a story that you could honestly see in almost any time period of the modern era of human history in almost any uh, civilization that we have had about corrupt individuals doing what they want to maintain power, wealth, and securing their own positions and enriching themselves instead of serving their community. That's what it boils down to. And so Code 8, if you were a fan of The Wire, you could actually watch Code 8. And as you're watching, think about it in those terms. When you look at the drug dealer in it, yeah, he's dealing in a mystical, weird, science fictional drug. But it could just as easily be any one of the illicit substances that are traded today. When you look at the tower block where the people with these superpowers live, you're right, but it's not just superpowers. It could be any marginalized group that you can literally watch this film on a surface level as, oh, it's just a slightly dystopian near future science fiction film. Or you can understand an underlying meaning to it and yet another train. I'm, I'm going to try and, and cut as much of that out as I can because that, that was a very long train. I've also forgotten where I was, what I was talking about. But the essential point to all this is if anyone says there are only three types of stories, there are only five types of stories. Eh? On the one hand, no. Stories are much more complex than that. Narrative is much more complex than that. But on the other hand, yeah, there's a grain of truth to this, that there are patterns in narrative forms. There are patterns in narrative structures. Now, if you distill things into a broad enough generic abstract form, of course it's going to become uh, applicable to a whole host of very disparate things. And you, but if, if you say there's only one form of story and you take something like The Quest, and you say, right, well, that's the Lord of the Rings. It's also Raiders of the Lost Ark and Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And it's also Percy Jackson. Well, how, how useful is that as a description of story when the overlap between those things could be radically different? Because essentially it's just saying, yeah, it's a travel log with a goal to acquire something. So any sort of tra uh, travel log where there is a goal at the end of it to get something, you're going, oh, these are all the same story. They're not, they're radically different. They're aimed at different audiences. They use different techniques. They are written in different styles. They involve completely different characters. There are different moral lessons that are learned. There's so much about them that is unique that when people say there are only X number of stories, because it changes and people come up with different formulations of this. But when people say that, what we're talking about are generalized plot movements. And it's the same when it comes to genre. Again, genre is a very broad term that we applied of grouping like and like. But within that, there is such unique variability that I like fantasy series 
right, well, what do you mean by series? What type of fantasy? Oh, well, you know, The Lord of the Rings. But The Lord of the Rings was written as a singular narrative and it was published as a trilogy, but it's subdivided into six books anyway. But it was written as a singular narrative. That's not a typical series. And do you mean series or serial? Do you want something that is one continuing adventure or do you want something that is episodic in nature? Like, even how we describe something as simple as series is going to hinge on the elements that we are used to or that we want to exemplify, that we cannot take as read when we say, I like series, that the other person knows what we mean. Because series in and of itself has multiple ways it can be expressed. If someone really likes the Harry Potter books, they may love the Worst Witch books, or they might love the uh, the school days novels. Like, oh, what was the one about the English kid at boarding school, and every week there were, or every term there was a new adventure they went on? There's a whole load of them. I always forget the name of them. But or the Harry Potter books was it the oh it was the magic they liked. Well, worse witch might work better than the school days novels. But if it was the boarding school aesthetic and the, the clubbing together of the, the plucky young hero and the friends, then the, the school days novels um, set in Edwardian or Victorian or um, early, early 20th century England, like all of those could equally suffice because it's not the magical element. So when we talk about genre, making assumptions about what genre is and what genre should do and all of this sort of stuff, that often takes us down a very strange place because making an assumption that science fiction should act in a certain way, well, well, what type of science fiction? Well, space opera. And you go, well, is the space opera the setting, the language that is glossing over everything, and the story itself is actually a fantasy story or a horror story? Because those can all be space opera, but they'll be radically different. Is it, oh, well, fantasy, epic fantasy should do this. Well, again, is it glossed over in fantasy terminology, but actually it's a social commentary using fantasy as a way to explore social commentary. That's a very valid approach. Or I've made this fantastical world and from that, how it has changed the evolution of humankind that has led to these stories evolving. And I think they're really interesting. Again, just as valid an approach. And that's kind of what I wanted to get to. Things are rarely as simple as I have identified the genre or the subgenre. I've identified the thing. That is just a label. And that label is attached to a whole lot of assumptions understanding that is the start of well okay if this is called science fiction what elements of science fiction are there it is a starting point so many of these definitions and labels and approaches are starting points it's an initial place to begin an analysis it is not the end point of analysis it's not even the end point of understanding oh it has spaceships in it this is science fiction or it could be science fantasy space fantasy or any number of alternate history dystopia there are different genres that these things could apply to and so isolating elements and saying it corresponds to this genre that is always a starting point and that's kind of what i wanted to get to with this because code it if you're a big fan of the wire this is a simplified form of an episode of The Wire. If you're a fan of Westerns, you'll probably enjoy Roadhouse because it's a modern day Western. Um, and it's fascinating to me because sometimes we think these terms, these definitions are prescriptive and go, this is what the thing is, as if it is somehow siloed off from all the rest of narrative. And there is such bleed over on the surface level, on the contextual level, on the structural level, on the cognitive level, on the symbolic level. There can be so many different layers and levels of complexity and connection that identifying a genre through surface level elements 
can be useful, but it can also lead us astray. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Sorry about the trains. Thank you for your continued support, and I'll see you in the next one.